LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice tumbling down the rabbit hole I can see it in your eyes you have the look of a man who accepts what he sees because he is expecting to wake up let me tell you why you're here you're here because you know something what you know you can't explain but you feel it. you felt it your entire life that there's something wrong with you. you don't know what it is but it's there like a splinter in your mind driving do you know what I'm talking about? Do you want to know what it is? The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window. Or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work. When you go to church. When you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth that you are a slave. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Right now, we're inside a computer program? Is it really so hard to believe? Your appearance now is what we call residual self-image. It is the mental projection of your digital self. This... this isn't real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, you can taste and see then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain you have to see it for yourself you have to see it for yourself you have to see it for yourself greetings and welcome once again to legalizefreedom.com I'm your host, Greg Moffat, welcoming you to episode 170, the very first show of 2016. My guest today is Dr. Rory McSweeney, who returns for part two of a three-part series discussing some of the ideas in his book, The Paradox of Lucid Dreaming, A Metaphysical Theory of Mind. If you enjoy the show, you may wish to explore the extensive archive at legalizefreedom.com that's legalize-freedom.com and you can spell legalize with an S or a Z. And there you'll also find a donate page should you wish to contribute towards keeping the site up and running. You can also follow us on Twitter at Legalize Freedom, spelt with an S, and on Facebook as Legalize Freedom, of course, a media, news and publishing page. During today's show, we delve deep into the dream space, discussing how the barriers between dreams and reality and between mind and matter are dissolving as we awaken once again to the true nature of the world and the wider cosmos, one of paradox, illusion and constant change. The cosmos and the so-called laws which govern it are not static. The dualistic model of reality promoted by Western materialist reductionism is revealing itself as just another dogma. The scientific method has brought us many benefits, but the core concept that some empirical reality actually exists is constantly and increasingly being challenged by our lived experience of subjective realities and the limits of mass consensual reality. 
If you think you're awake, you're dreaming. And if you know you're dreaming, you're awake. Hello and welcome, Rory, and thank you so much for joining us once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thanks for having me back. Much appreciated. Now, today, Rory, we're doing a follow-up uh, of sorts to an interview that you and I did a few weeks ago. And once again, we're going to be talking about ideas springing from your uh, new book just released, The Paradox of Lucid Dreaming, A Metaphysical Theory of Mind. As a way of diving into this, um, in the first interview, you did quite an extensive explanation of your background and your work in general. So perhaps as a way of encouraging people to investigate that first talk, I, I suggest that we dive straight into the book. And if people really want to know about you personally, there's a link to your uh, your website on this interview page, or they can listen to the first interview. And as a way of getting started, I'd like you just to talk about what lucid dreaming is versus regular dreaming. And that's going to drop us all in at the deep end. Great. So, and a, a, a lucid dream really is a dream during which we become aware of the fact that we're dreaming while we're dreaming. That's the simplest definition of it. So what that effectively means is that we have the same kind of intellectual insight as we have in our current state of consciousness, which is we can enter into a kind of an internal dialogue in our own minds and actually reflect on the locale of our circumstances, asking, is this a dream? We can then go ahead and test that. We can actually perform particular tests on the dream environment in order to ascertain the nature of that environment. So one, for example, would be to stick your index finger through the palm of your opposing hand. And this would certainly be possible in a dream, because in a dream it's possible, not always, but mostly, to pass matter through matter. Another test might be, for example, to lean forward and see if you float off the ground gently. And there are a variety of tests based on the, 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 the physics of dreaming, so to speak. Um, and, and that's really, I suppose, the fundamental difference between the lucid dream and the regular dream. There is something between, which is what we've all experienced too, where we're kind of aware we're dreaming, but we haven't really stopped and asked ourselves and, and concluded for example, using a reality check that we were absolutely dreaming. So I guess we could call that semi-lucid or pre-lucid, perhaps. So there is a whole spectrum from a regular dream to that semi-pre-lucid, right through to the actual lucid dream. And of course, if you are having a lucid dream, there are likewise degrees of lucidity. You could be lucid, but a little bit tied up in the whole kind of dream narrative. You could be lucid and very aware of something you had planned to do in the dream and perform that test. Um, right up to verging on the uh, on, on on the the state of absolutely pinpoint awake, um, and, and that that whole spectrum, as I said, is possible to experience. Now, many times I've had the sensation of apparently making decisions uh, within the dream environment uh, to turn left or right, to go with through a door or to not go through a door, things like that, and. The best way I can sum it up is thinking about it when later in the waking state was like, yeah, I decided to do that. But when I was quote unquote deciding, I wasn't aware that I was dreaming. So that's something different. This sort of you're in the dream and, you know, you appear to be making decisions or you have this sense while you're dreaming that you're consciously doing something, um, whether it's running away from someone or whatever it happens to be. That's not the same. Or, or does that fall where would that fall on the spectrum? Yeah, see, that's, that's a really important point um, to distinguish because the, the number of times I've described lucid dreaming to people, I've been met with, oh, I lucid dream every night, or, you know, I've had hundreds of them. The fact of the matter is, you know, we'll all have some degree of lucidity in our lifetime, um, some more than others, and perhaps, you know, spontaneously without having any kind of training necessarily or attempt to lucid dream, people may have spontaneous lucid dreams for a variety of reasons. But what you're describing right there is not what we would typically describe as a lucid dream. We, in the book, I specifically mention the employment of the reality check as the proverbial definition of the lucid dream. One doesn't necessarily have to perform the, the reality check, as I say in the book, but it's that level of intellectual insight that prompts you to actually say, is this a dream? Let me test this. Let me look around. Let me somehow confirm to myself that I am in fact dreaming, whether that's specifically forming a reality check or whether it's something a little more peripheral, just looking around the room and recognizing that this is a dream. I can see from looking around the room, this is a dream. Um, that's That to me is the difference. But again, you know, people will have such a variety of experiences around this area um, that they will frequently 
talk about lucid dreaming as it's something a little trivial. It's not. It's quite an intense experience when one actually has one. Um, and, and as to say, uh, when one has one, one would certainly know it from when they don't have one. If somebody comes to me and says, well, I think I've had a lucid dream, then you haven't had a lucid dream. I think your expression in the book is something along the lines of if you think you're awake, you're dreaming. And if you know you're dreaming, you're awake. So here's the deal with that one. That really reflects on the kind of meta lucid dream of life itself. So I'm kind of taking in the opening chapter, I'm, 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 I'm kind of the, the opening uh, verse of the book really is me telling you that at this very moment, as we speak, wherever you are, you're dreaming that this life that you believe to be real, although it is real, is a different kind of reality to the reality you think it is, because it is in fact a dream. But of course, you don't think it's a dream, you think that you're awake right now. And what I'm suggesting is that when you actually realize that the life you're living is in fact a kind of dream, or for that matter, I don't even need to qualify by saying a kind of dream, because I think that does a disservice. When you realize that the life you're living is in fact a dream, then you know you're dreaming. Hence, if you know you are dreaming, you're awake. You're awake in the dream of life. But likewise, for people who think they're awake, who think they're not dreaming, in fact, they're dreaming. They're dreaming this experience and they're experiencing it the same way as we normally experience a dream, which is we take it for granted. We don't normally go into the world of dreams and question the nature of that reality. We experience dreaming by simply accepting the circumstances as they unfold, bizarre as they may be. We just accept whatever comes to us. So in effect, the, the kind of paradox there, as I said, is that if you think you're awake, in fact, you're actually dreaming. And if you know you're dreaming, in fact, you're actually awake. And that's quite a, a little play on words in the opening chapter. I think a lot of people will wrestle with that idea in their own way, but it, it, it makes a lot of sense if you play with it. Well, perhaps we can use that as a bridge then to the idea of the, of the dreamlike nature of quote unquote reality mm -hmm. uh, in coming from the or stemming from the fact that that reality is has a great degree of subjectivity about it. We can talk about our own personal experience of what's out there, the three D world, and different ideas about a consensus reality, you know, what we agree upon and what results uh, there. But this, in some ways, this is kind of like an elephant in the room for science subjectivity, <laughs> isn't it? You know, because mm -hmm. it, science likes to believe, for example, that it's completely objective and that scientists set aside their subjectivity, their, their own ideas to do objective science. But when you start to actually look at it, ironically, from a, from a cutting edge scientific point of view, it's then that the subjective nature of, of reality begins to emerge. Well, what kind of inspired my, how would I say, particular execution of this essay was this notion that what has been described to us by Einstein's equations is, in fact, a, a world that is in, inherently relative. Einstein does not describe the world as absolute space or absolute time. He says, just like Aristotle and just like we've observed through various other kinds of essays, the uh, uses of microwave background radiation and so forth, that the universe itself is is not absolute in terms of space and time. So we have to describe it, as Einstein says, as a theory of relativity. So we can't actually say anything is anywhere unless we relate it to everything else. Um, so therefore, what we have in essence is uh, a world that is relative that we're trying to describe objectively. And, and that actually ends up in a paradox. How can you get an absolute answer out of a relative system, if you follow what I'm saying by that? Mm -hmm. um, any which way you try to get an absolute out of a relative system, you end up with a paradox. And that's really what has forced the hand of physics to start writing uh, quantum mechanics into the, into our world. But the problem with quantum mechanics is, and, and of course there there is an inherent kind of sense of subjectivity creeping up in the whole quantum mechanics affair. The problem with quantum mechanics is that if you try to combine quantum mechanics with relativity theory, if you try to try to forge the equations into some sort of a, a union of uh, mathematical apparatus, you end up with not just an infinity, but an infinity of infinities, which of course is once more a paradox. And where I was kind of going with this whole idea was that 
when we hit a paradox, for most scientists, philosophers, Western thinkers, a paradox is a kind of a speed bump in their thinking. It's It slows them down. It stops them in their tracks and says, okay, we've got a paradox, which means we must be doing something wrong. That's how we interpret a paradox. But where I'm coming from, as somebody who has a background in karate and Zen particularly, um, is that a paradox is not a drag force in your thinking. The paradox is the point. <laughs> the point is to resolve the paradox, but not necessarily to treat the paradox like a riddle, as it's often interpreted. A lot of people see uh, Zen and they look at Zen and think it's all full of riddles and mishmash and it's, you know, a lot of waffle. Um, but actually, the game you're playing is the game of paradox. Can you figure it out? Can you get past the paradox? Because if you can, you can understand something about the nature of reality that you cannot understand from the point of view of uh, mechanical reality, from the point of view of causality, from space-time mechanics, from four-dimensional space-time apparatus. You, you, if you try to resolve the matter that way, you end up with a paradox. And as Einstein once said, you can't resolve a problem with the same type of consciousness that created that problem. And the type of consciousness that has created that kind of problem is a peculiar type of consciousness known as self-reflective awareness, which is what you and I and everybody else listening to this podcast has. And what we have, in essence, is this self-reflective type apparatus, and we're trying to resolve something infinite with it. And, and, and that's really where the paradox starts to creep up. It really is the, the question of either or versus and both. Yeah. In, in, in those terms. And the either or is really very much, I mean, that, even thinking about that takes me back to maths at school or, uh, you know, the early days of computer science. And it's, um, you know, something can't be both. Uh, but the, the and both thing is actually very, very appealing to us on one level. We're, we're getting into philosophy here, uh, <laughs> if, you know, very quickly. But, um, you know, that's sort of like the teaching of the ages, isn't it really? And then you get back to sort of, the limitations of language, really, and, and onto the realms of symbolism and what have you. I know you talk a great deal about language in the book and about, you know, the development of that and what, what sort of consciousness we perhaps had prior to that, you know, in terms of communication and understanding and interpretation of our environment. Yeah. I mean, really, that, that is the crux of the thing ultimately is that the, the kind of language we employ is inherently dualistic. Um, we describe something, as you said, as this or that. We don't have a word for this and that. We don't have a word that says this and that. Um, but we, we have to learn to build that language. And, and we are doing so. And currently that language, that we're, the, the bones of that language at least is written in mathematics. But what is written in mathematics will ultimately translate into everyday speak. And it will do so by becoming something apparent in our world, uh, something that will become like everything in our world, uh, probably a piece of technology initially that we will, you know, be able to use. And then we'll start to examine and question and talk about more sophisticated ways. And our children's children and their children's children will talk about these things in very matter of fact fashion, whereby to you and me might still be a uh, somewhat of a novelty. Um, but as an example <clears throat> of the and or, uh, pardon me, the, uh, the, the this or that, um, as opposed to the either or that kind of question, uh, we're moving from binary computing technology into quantum computing technology. And quantum computing technology is not zeros and ones. It's zero, one, and it's zero, and it's one. And it's zero, one. It's, it's quantum, basically. It's, it's, so when we start to uh, see these quantum computing devices, um, you know, creeping into our, our world, uh, eventually into our houses, into our phones, into our lives, we will have to have a language to accommodate this, this leap of technology. We'll have to say, well, what's different about a quantum computer to a regular computer? And somebody's going to say, well, it computes things not by looking at them in a binary fashion. It computes things by looking at them in a quantum fashion, which is not zero and one. It's, it's zero and it's one. Um, so this is going to become much more apparent to us. And as it does become apparent to us, naturally, our language is going to change around that. And as our language changes around it, so is our perception. And as our perception starts to change around it, so effectively will our world. And that's what's happening. We're starting to build a kind of a an orthogonal reality with uh, cyberspace right now. Uh, we, we are lit literally uh, putting the building blocks, the foundations of a new world in place. 
um, and, and that new world will be fashioned um, very much with quantum technology. Well, we'll talk a lot more about quantum technology, quantum physics, and the future um, a little later on. I hope listeners will bear with me and you. I just want to linger a little longer in the dream space because, as I say, we got th- these topics are so exciting and they drive thinking forward so fast. It's it's so easy just to to leap, you know, in twenty different directions at once. So, r- rounding off, thinking about about dreaming just for people who are, you know, we, we started out talking about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's um, bring it back to the table. Yeah. Your, what was your journey uh, into lucid dreaming? Because as I understand it, this is something that I am, I, I believe as conscious as I can be about this, that this is not something I have experienced that I'm aware of or that I recall. Is this something that can happen, that happens spontaneously to individuals is there, a, is there a spectrum through to being able to entrain yourself to experience this? Yeah, I, I would say that for most people, a little conversation like you and I are having right now is enough to trigger the possibility of having a lucid dream in their minds. This is something I actually address in the book, that the most important piece of technology you need to have to have a lucid dream is the language to actually understand what a lucid dream is. The to actually know that it's possible to have a lucid dream can be enough to have a lucid dream. If you don't know what a lucid dream is, it's almost impossible to stop in a dream and ask, am I dreaming? Because we're we're so conditioned to believe that we can't be self-aware in dreams that we almost reject the idea of being able to have a dream. In fact, many people who who have had brief instances, and you'll frequently hear this from people, uh, that they recognize that they're dreaming. Their first reaction is, oh yeah, sometimes I realize I'm dreaming, and when I do, I immediately want to wake myself up. And to be frank, I used to do that. Oh, I'm dreaming, I better wake up. But why do you want to wake up? You know, so the first thing to recognize is, you know, okay, oh, I think I'm dreaming. Stop trying to wake up, try and stay in it. So that's the first thing. If you think you could be dreaming, don't try and get out of it. It's in some sort of a bizarre reaction in our psyche that when we realize we're dreaming, we should wake up like it's something naughty, something we shouldn't do. It's anti-establishment. It's anti-thought police, whatever way you want to put it. Somehow we're socially conditioned to reject the idea that we can be awake in dreams. So the first thing is just to recognize that it's possible. So there's a very good chance that listeners who are, you know, tuning into this show will become lucid on that basis alone without having done anything. I've had so many instances of that when I've done a talk or I've done a show or something like that and people come up to me, or, you know, on Facebook or whatever some couple of weeks later and I heard your stuff, I heard your stuff and I, and I had a lucid dream sense and it's blown my mind and so on. So that's the first thing. Um, in terms of formally training for it, uh, th- the fact of the matter is that there's a lot of stuff out there um, that goes from various kinds of NLP type techniques where you're visually rehearsing cues and you're starting to look for signs that you're dreaming in your waking state and trying to carry that habit over into your dream state to kind of more hands-on approaches whereby you're actually breaking up your sleep in the middle of the night, uh, trying to hijack the best chemistry. Your dreaming chemistry is optimal after about four hours of sleep. So you're, you're using specific techniques, uh, in, you know, employing your alarm clock to get you out of bed after four hours to get up and go back to bed and try to focus your mind to catch the dream. Um, there are technologies that are developing around this area, specifically uh, one that's been around for quite some time, actually, probably the best part of 30 years now, which is a device that you sit over your eyes and it sends these LED cues via your eyelids through your eyes into the dreaming brain. In effect, there are flashing lights in front of your eyes when you start dreaming. And those flashing lights actually translate to some kind of imagery in the dream, which gives you a a cue in the dream that you're dreaming. It's a really fascinating piece of technology, and it does work. And there are a number of them on the uh, market, you know, trying to compete to try and make the ultimate one. Um, There's one called Aurora that did a big... uh, Kickstarter campaign, they came close to a quarter of a million on Kickstarter. Um, and they've had that guy in development for at least two years. They, they finished their Kickstarter campaign two years ago and they're still saying, we're almost finished. I, I hope the fuck they bring out the, like the, the, the proverbial <laughs> Mercedes of this. People have paid money for that thing two fucking years ago. Jesus Christ. 
Um, but it could be good. It's a headband and it's got an LED light and it recognizes when you're dreaming and sends you signals and so forth. And, um, you know, it's, it's nothing that hasn't been done before. Stephen LeBurge made the same thing 30 years ago, um, except it was a bit clunkier. Um, but they, they work. They definitely work. I've used them. Uh, something you can use as well, which people are a little bit not so sure of, and I'm not going to necessarily advocate it, but is really effective, is to use um, what I call onirogens. Onirogens coming from the word onero or the study of dreams and they are in fact uh, lucid dreaming food food supplements so they're basically pills you get from the internet and there's one particularly good brand called Dreamleaf and uh, I'm not trying to endorse anybody's product particularly I'm just telling you it's a good product uh, you take a blue pill when you go to bed and you get up after four hours and you take a red pill and then you go back to bed and it enhances the chemistry to try to have a lucid dream all of it scientifically sound, and I've tried it, and it's very effective. So there really is a plethora of techniques, and you, if you go to my own website, you'll find my own work, but by all means, uh, look around the internet. There are so many people teaching it. With regard to the um, the idea of the functioning of those light devices, you know, which uh, go over your, eyes, your eyelids, um, that reminds me of that delicious idea of that you see playing out in fiction so many times of... Uh, there being a signifier uh, to let someone know that they're in a certain state of consciousness. You know, typically the dream. It's like, oh, you know, there's that that, there's that black cat on the roof. Mm-hmm. You know, you should look out for it. And it's, sometimes it's like, oh, that's good. But quite often it's like, oh, no, you know, <laughs> it's that it's that man in the Mac with the hat pulled down over his eye sort of thing. You're standing mm-hmm. on the street corner, you know. Yeah, I mean, the thing about I, I personally... Uh, it's not, it, you know, when I'm teaching now, I'm doing workshops next year and, um, not to let the proverbial cat out of the bag, no pun intended. Um, but for me, visual cues tend, we tend to confabulate them. When we receive a visual cue from the dream, um, I mean, pretty much everything, somebody says to me, you know, as LeBurge has done, Stephen LeBurge, he'd be one of the kind of pioneers of lucid dreaming. His kind of, you know, at the time, what he was talking primarily about were, were called dream signs. So dream signs mostly are visual cues because mostly dream, uh, dreaming is, it's largely visual. It's audio visual, but it's largely visual experience. So we're looking for bizarre, uh, irregular incongruencies in the environment to alert us to the fact that we're dreaming. But here's the question I put back to that. Isn't everything in the dream bizarre? I mean, in terms of our actual reality as we know it, I mean, there's nothing in my dream world that I would not find bizarre, pretty much. Most of, if I took a snapshot of any of my dreams from last night, I would probably say, I don't know that person, I don't know that place, I don't know this thing here, I, I in fact, I have no idea where that is. And yet, somehow, my mind is conditioned to accept that. So, to say that you find something bizarre in that, and if that's what you're looking for, it, it, it kind of doesn't add up to me. Because it's all bizarre. Um, when I personally realize I'm dreaming, sometimes the visual cues give me a hint, yes. But for the most part, at least initially, I used to just kind of realize I was dreaming. And I wasn't sure why exactly. I would just, just realize I was dreaming. And eventually it became apparent to me that the thing that was giving me personally an alert to the fact that I was dreaming was the sensation of my body. So in dreams, we have got a body, so to speak. Um, now, most people have a term for that. They call it the dream body. They call it the subtle body, the energy body. And there's a whole lot of horseshit going around about that because nobody has really examined the physics of the body in the dream. For that matter, nobody's examined the idea of physics in the dream apart from me. I'm, that's, that's my work that I'm pioneering. Um, but what I discovered personally is that the weight of your body relative to the environment, in other words, the kind of interface of the the dream body and the environment in terms of the gravitational pull, the sense of mass, the sense of of of, of corporeal physicality, so to speak, um, that that kinesthetic intelligence we have to feel our bodies from the inside, that is very distorted in dreaming, and personally where I like to try to focus my attention when I'm trying to have a lucid dream is I focus my attention onto my body and I try to 
try to direct my mind towards the sensation of my body. So for me, it's a rather than a visual cue, which I said is just completely saturated. Everything in the dream is bizarre, and yet we don't recognize it. So I don't see how you can pick out something bizarre from something bizarre, if you follow what I'm saying. Um, but for me, it's the, the kinesthetic cue, and that's kind of where I would direct people's attention towards. And that's certainly a, a, a step in a slightly different direction to what anybody else is talking about. But my focus is the dream body in terms of my research. So that's maybe I'm a little bit um, biased in that way. In terms of um, bizarreness or strangeness of the uh, the dream space, uh, it occurred to me a while ago that in some ways the texture or the quality of our own past, the distant past, starts to become dreamlike in the sense of it. You know, you think of, depending on your age, do, do a relative one here, like what happened to you 20 years ago? To what extent does that feel different to what happened yesterday? And that led me to the thought that in terms of what I think is bizarre, and I'm not, not trying to be too literal here, but, uh, you know, it, it is a real sensation, you know, it is a real psychological, emotional experience. When I walk out of the door or, you know, like as I, today I did this morning and when I do it tomorrow, the space I find myself in is pretty fucking bizarre, you know, <laughs> in terms of what the world as I might create it if the contents of my mind and my psychology and my emotions became manifest physically, if you see what I mean. In some ways, I can have the dream that yet strange, it qualifies as surreal, you know, bizarre, like some kind of Pink Floyd album cover gone horribly wrong, <laughs> you know. But then look out the window, you know, that's, it's got, for me, it's got a similar uh, quality to it. It's just different. It's just different colors, if you see what I mean, but it's got a similar feeling of like unreality. I don't know if, if that makes any sense to you. Yeah, well, and, and this is the thing that I'm, you know, in the opening chapter of the book, what I said I found particularly strange about lucid dreaming, or my, my first ever lucid dream, I talk about it in the book, as uh, it seems like a kind of a courteous thing to do when you're talking about that subject, my first lucid dream. Um, but what, what struck me about it was not how different it was to wake in reality, but it was actually how similar it was. And I talked about the fact that when I was running in the dream that I could feel my feet pounding the ground and I was just, and I could feel the, the kind of sensation of the ground traveling through my shin bone into my knee, into my hips, into the rest of my body shuddering as I ran down this, uh, this pathway. Um, and I, I distinctly remember even today, I remember the sensation of bang, 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 my legs thumping on the ground as I'm running and kind of thinking to myself, fuck, I'm dreaming and I can feel everything and, and it feels real and it feels real and, and me, somewhere in the back of my mind, thinking it feels real because, well, because it is real. And what the fuck, Jesus, what's reality now? What's the whole thing just lit at that moment? I, I, it was just so apparent to me that, that dreaming and what we call the physical world were woven from the same fabric. And it was only a matter of time before I, I started to kind of look at this idea and, and take it quite seriously. Because up until then, of course, I was firmly convinced that and I quote, dreams are something that happen in your head, and this is the real world. But that model of reality is a crock of shit. It doesn't work at all. There's, what, I mean, there's this riddle but paradox for a start off, as I outline. Um, I mean, to say, for example, that something happens in your head, that you're, that the, the world you see happens in your head. But I, I gave the example and said that, you know, if you were to look at your own, your own brain in your hands, if you were to somehow, as a thought experiment, take your brain out of your head, hold it in your hands, and look at it in your hands, you would be seeing that brain with the brain that you're looking at. It makes no fucking sense whatsoever. The idea of anything happening in your head is a really, really silly idea. Um, and it doesn't add up. Um, we don't know where anything is happening. We don't know what it means to say anything is happening in your head as opposed to it's happening here and now. When you're experiencing it as you are when you're dreaming, that is reality in the same way that you're experiencing reality right now. And we need to build a whole new model to accommodate that. And that's precisely what I'm proposing. And that's very consistent with what you're describing to me right there, except you're kind of describing from, from, the, from the other side of the coin. Even at a very basic level, I remember as a kid being told that um, you know my dreams weren't real. But just to help people get their heads around it, if this seems very counterintuitive for them, um, think of an experience, good, bad, 
uh, usually it's, it's at the extremes that we remember, those things that prompt us to wake up sometimes that you have had in dreams. Not lucid dreaming now, I'm just talking about, you know, you folks out there who have dreams of a night. Think about sometime you had a nightmare or sometimes sometime when you dreamt of something wonderful happening. Well, it, in, to what extent did that not happen? Okay, let's say you dreamt that you won the lottery. You wake up in the morning and you're still broke. Okay, you can, <laughs> say, you can say that it didn't happen. But as we'll probably explore a bit later on, to what extent is you being broke happening, if you see what I mean? And how much of a role are you playing in that? If you have something terrible happen in a dream, like you're uh, attacked with a knife or you know mugged or something like that, to what extent did that not happen? Particularly if you wake up very distressed, as some people do. You know, think of people who are um, an extreme case here, people who are suffering from uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, maybe people who have been combat veterans. What they go through of a night, waking up screaming in a cold sweat, you tell them that isn't real? You see what I mean? So, so I mean, it really, I suppose the, the question, therefore, is how we define reality. I mean, what you're alluding to is this notion, perhaps, of consensual reality versus a personal reality. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the word reality is what is what remains there, whether it be a kind of personal encounter or whether it be a counter, an encounter that, that we can all um, evaluate uh, consensually. Um, it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not real. It's just a different kind of reality. Um, and, and, you know, reality does not imply inherently, uh, and that's something I address in the book really is this, this idea of do we have, does reality have to be, is, is reality inherently consensual? In other words, do we have to have a group of people all together experiencing the same thing for it to be consensual? And, you know, most people would say yes. And I didn't disagree with that, incidentally, in the book. Um, I actually took uh, a very, very unique loophole argument on that with the ayahuasca, which I don't really want to get into right now because it's going to take us way off course. Um, but it, it was something that I, that I, that I felt argued sufficiently that we can allow for, um, consensual reality, subjective reality, and we can also allow for something in between whereby we have a mutual group of observers having a group, a, don't don't want to use the term hallucination, but want to have they can have a group experience of something which might be, you know, described as a hallucination by people who are a little less um, informed on the subject. But they can have a group encounter of a reality which would be, which would not necessarily be uh, uh, consensual to everybody. If you follow what I'm saying, I, again, I don't want to get into that too much, but I, there is there is a, a very very intelligent argument in there. Um, that, that kind of gets us out of that loophole and the conclusion ultimately being that, uh, reality does not have to be consensual necessarily. No, I think that's a very important point you're making. I know you said you don't want to go down a cul-de-sac, but this idea of a, a group encounter with a particular reality. Um, Shall we go there? If you want to do that, undress it now, it's fine. I mean, I just, so I don't want to kind of take you off your natural train of thought there, but I think it's very important because we're, we're probably on that idea and I think that we probably, maybe it's the right time to take it out and undress it. Well, it is because it, it's, mo <coughs> it's, mo it's, it's modes of reality. Um, a cliched example of this situation might be a few friends sitting around uh, sharing a joint and, uh, you know, getting a bit, bit high. Things are starting to happen and one of them says, hey man, you know... <laughs> What's that purple goblin thing on the rug? <laughs> and uh, somebody else says, what are you talking about? You're out of your mind. You're saying things. And then somebody else says, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. The purple goblin. He's right. And then the third person goes, oh, shit, yeah. The <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I'm talking about, to be honest with you. But what I said with the ayahuasca specifically is that with the shaman and the ayahuasca, what the shaman can do is the shaman can actually use their music to specifically weave the architecture of the visual apparatus that the person sees behind closed eyes. So in the ayahuasca experience, um, when the groups sit together in ceremony, the, the shaman's music actually guides the vision. And it does so through a process of called, uh, that I described called synesthesia. Now, synesthesia very simply means that our senses get mixed up. So we can, for example, see sounds and we can hear colors and we can taste colors, for example. Uh, so somebody might, for example, uh, see the smell of roses or they might see the smell of uh, fish, for example, or they might taste fish when they see a certain color and so on. Um, so with psychedelics, there is 
uh, synesthesia. And it's very easy to demonstrate. If you are brave enough to take uh, a handful of magic mushrooms and sit down and allow the hallucinatory, and I don't like that term because it implies something quite derogatory and totally misinterpreted, and it's a very antiquated term, but for, you know, the more common speak language, when we allow the visions to take place, um, we can start to kind of make the visions perform in a certain way. If you listen to, for example, classical music when you're having the visions, and then you switch, for example, to trance music, and then you, for example, switch to heavy metal music, and you can repeat this a number of times in a row, you'll see that each time you change the particular type of music you're listening to, the visual, the, the, the visions appear to kind of change texture as well. And it's very, 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 very peculiar, and it's very, very apparent. There's no ambiguity in your mind. So the, the, the shaman kind of hijacks this idea, and what the shaman actually does is he sings or she sings, pardon me, um, they're Icaros. Now, the Icaros is the kind of, uh, it's it's the term for sacred song that the, the shaman will tell you was taught to the shaman by the plants, um, is in the Amazon jungle. And Icaros is a, it's a semi-Spanish word. Um, and the idea being that the, the song that the shaman sings is peculiar to the particular plant and the ceremony and so forth. And, and because of the sound of the shaman's voice and the instruments they play and the, the words of the song and so forth, somehow it guides the vision into a particular essay. So it would be possible for a group of people to sit in ceremony and all have a similar visionary experience which would not be apparent to somebody who was not taking the ayahuasca, but to everybody else in the room who was taking the ayahuasca, they could agree and often do on the particulars of the vision. Uh, in fact, in, in the kind of uh, larger ceremonies where you've got, you know, big, big numbers of people, as you do sometimes in the Santo Dame Church in Brazil and the likes, they have literally sometimes up to hundreds of people taking ayahuasca at the same time. Um, they will literally have discussions afterwards together and talk about the, the, the visions that the shaman painted. And they'll be able to talk about it quite, you know, openly with each other. I like to do this and I like to do this. Oh, yes, I thought that was nice too. Um, so that's an example of a consensual experience of reality, which would be by and from the point of view of a of a bystander who's not participating in the psychedelic experience, that would be non-consensual to them, but it would be consensual to those involved in the um, in the ceremony. So what we have is a subset of reality that is taking place which is not apparent to somebody in our current consensual set of reality. So that's a really, really important argument when we talk about how we define reality. Because if we can have that subset of consensual reality, as in, and we can have that in the same proximity as our consensual reality, then that opens up the door for a single person to have a single experience of a, of a, of a visionary experience, which would be equally valid by that approximation. So therefore, that allows us to talk about reality as a single subjective experience and not necessarily as an exclusively consensual experience as would be defined by the uh, empiricist material reductionist um, in the society uh, that they don't have the last word on the definition of reality uh, sometimes people people confuse um, material reductionism or western science for fact material reductionism or western science it's not a fact, it's a way of looking at reality. And uh, certainly for those who want to kind of get into that argument a little bit deeper, I'd highly recommend um, Rupert Sheldrake's uh, The Science Delusion, where he completely uh, <laughs> fucks that up. He does, doesn't he? Um, <laughs> he's, he's... Goodbye to science. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with the scientific matter or the scientific method. I mean, I'm uh, all about the scientific method. I don't want to be to come across anti-scientific, I'm not. But what I do want to get, come across as is anti-dogmatic. And insisting that reality must be consensual is a dogma, not a fact. I wonder if there's anything here in the situations that you get sometimes when, for example, there's a, um, a traffic accident and the cops are going around gathering reports and they get conflicting reports from people. Now, I've, I've heard this example used before when people have been talking about consensual versus non-consensual reality and subjective reality. I'm not talking about people here who are somehow confused there are people who saw something and they reported it and somebody else saw something and it wasn't because they were at a different angle or, you know, whatever it happens to be looking at the accident. And you also get other more mundane things where someone says, uh, you know, 
they had different versions of a social gathering, you know, or different versions of a, a you know, a social event that happened or just a day to day event. And it's, they're both saying what happened as far as they're concerned. And I, I don't know if there's anywhere we can go with this, but I find it absolutely delicious, this idea that that there's panic induced in some people when they start to think, you know, there's, you could even leave the door open for two people to have a different experience of the same thing. And then you ask, well, what was the same thing? The same from whose perspective, you know? It just starts to open a whole can of worms or, you know, I don't know, sweeties, <laughs> depending on your perspective. Yeah, well, it does. I, I, well, I think that that's where we're headed. I mean, certainly that's very much uh, what what I, I think we need to to kind of talk about is how we we start to build a model of a world that is subjective and apparently objective at the same time. And this is the whole kind of paradox that we're having to kind of deal with. Um, but as I said, you know, Einstein has told us that we live in a relative universe, and yet we're looking for an objective truth in a relative universe, which, as I said, is an oxymoron. You, you, you won't ever be able to reveal that. It won't make any sense. And yet, somehow, there is sufficient weight of objectivity in our every ordinary, everyday experience to talk about the world as being, you know, we can talk about uh, empirical values like gravitational constant and the likes, and we can make predictions and technology and all of these things, which would imply very much that there is an empirical um, world that we live in. Um, but it, as you kind of push further into the physics, backwards in time, into the, sm into the smaller end of the spectrum, or whatever you want to define it, ultimately, at, at the edges, it's always woolly. At the edges, it's always going to be um, subjective and, and, and you know, it's something something very difficult to get our heads around there. Um, but th there there are ways of, of of building models to accommodate that. And 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 again, um, you know, it, it's something that I have gotten into in several talks. It's something that I'll frequently get into. Really, is that that there is such a thing as being able to be both. Uh, subjective and to have this apparently objective type motif at the same time. And the simple answer to that is, is an infinity. An infinity can express itself as something objective. Let me put, let me, let me try and try and put this idea together for people. So, I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I know I'm terrible for kind of taking things into the nth degree every time, but it's, it's just where I go. Um, so an infinity, to put it simply, is Everything. Everything, if it's everything, it's infinity. But if it's everything, then it's no thing in particular. It's not this, or it's not that, or it's not this, or it's, you know, you, you can't say that it's one thing or another thing, because it's infinity, it's non-finite, it's therefore nothing in particular, because it's everything all at the same time, so you can't say it's one thing or another. On the one hand, and then on the other hand, if it's everything, then it can be anything. Because if it's everything, it can be this, and it can be that, and it can be this, and this, and everything else. So here we have this crazy paradox where something is apparently something, but that something is also apparently nothing. And that's really what we're trying to deal with. And, you know, when we look at that on the surface, all we see is the something, and we say, well, yeah, and that's what it is. And if that something is, is, to our experience, kept that way at some level um, for long enough, it appears to be a fact. But nothing is ever uh, static in the universe. The universe itself, no two moments have ever been the same in the universe. The universe is in a constant state of change, in a constant state of flux, a constant state of flow, to use all those kind of common terms we're hearing more and more. And the reason it's in a constant state of change is because the nature of infinity is that anything, any form that is apparent in the infinity can't remain in that form indefinitely because that would be a finite structure and therefore it must dissolve away from its current context towards something else. And hence, everything, although it appears to be solid, is changing and dissolving and evolving and turning into something else. Even something like a mountain, a mountain might look like it's solid but a mountain is constantly changing shape. It's just that it's changing shape in a geometric time frame. Uh, sorry, in, in a, a, a what's that word? Geological. Uh, that's the word. Uh, a, a geological time frame that that's so far from the time frame that we know that we confuse a mountain for something solid. And and this is the 
the basic illusion that we fall into is that we start to see things in those different time frames and we think of them as being constant. The gravitational constant that we describe, as Rupert Sheldrake describes, is not a gravitational constant. It's fluctuating and it will fluctuate. It has to fluctuate. There is no such thing as a constant uh, because nothing is can be constant in infinity. But if it's moving at a slow enough pace in a certain fashion, it could be misconstrued for something constant or finite or objective. And and that's really the crux of the problem we have here. We have this apparently objective state of 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 reality, which we define as the uh, em- empirical material world, so to speak. And if you measure it in a certain way, it does appear to be quite constant. It does appear to have, and I quote, the laws of nature. But they're not laws, they're not fixed, as Rupert Schadler describes them. They're habits, and they're habits that are so ingrained in the way we measure, and the way we experience things, and with the times we're using, that it looks like the world is objective, that it looks like the world is solid. It looks like it behaves a certain way indefinitely, and that it's behaving that way because it's a law. But that law is not going to remain a law, because we will eventually bend those laws and break those laws, not because not because we, we, we did something to corrupt the nature of reality, but because reality itself is inherently plastic. Because behind these apparently objective laws, as we describe them, it's infinite. And it's just a question of having to kind of get, get our heads around that, start to play with that. Um, and that becomes very apparent to people either through the process of technology or in my case, through the process of altering your state of consciousness, where you really start to see what I call magic in effect. And when I, when I talk about magic in that way, um, I'm talking about magic as in the same way the shaman talks about magic. I'm not talking about tricks. I'm really talking about playing with the nature of reality, recognizing it's true. It's, it's infinite. Um, it's infinite. It's infinite backbone, so to speak. And that backbone is flexible. Yeah, Rupert Sheldrake talks about this in uh, the, the so-called laws of nature, as you said in his book, which you also mentioned, The Science Delusion. And if I remember rightly, he, he breaks it out, the basic ideas in his TED talk, uh, which was banned along <laughs> along with, the, you probably remember this controversy, along with the one that uh, Graham Hancock did. Mm. And this idea that so-called, I mean, men make laws, if you see what I mean, the idea mm-hmm. for me, the, the laws of nature are a bit like the laws of the land. You know, there's nothing mm-hmm. in there's nothing inherent in there. I mean, some of the psychoactive compounds that we discussed to here today and our previous talk, uh, well, the law says they're illegal. You know, <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? You know, <laughs> it means we're a fucking stupid bunch of monkeys. <laughs> yeah, it does rather, doesn't it? You know, but the idea that that gravity and e- Sheldrick even talks about light, the speed of light. Could, mm-hmm. could vary over time. And yeah. he, he's, I believe he cites, I uh, can't remember whether it's to do with measurements of gravity or light or both or neither and some other things. I just can't recall off the top of my head. But he talks about measurable variations in some of these things mm-hmm. that scientists in the mainstream are constantly running around adjusting for. Oh, yeah. In absolutely. order, in or, in order yeah. to keep them constant. <laughs> <laughs> of course they are. Because, you know, what, what we have here really is you know, we, we have a, a philosophical battle, in effect, uh, between those who want to keep things the way they are and those who feel that we have to change this thing because the old model simply doesn't stack up. This is very much like the battle that that eventually emerged between science and religion, um, uh, that, that the age of enlightenment, so to speak. You know, science... With the origin of the species, Darwin shows us that man wasn't created on the seventh, sixth day, whatever the fuck God, I don't remember who, what days he made what. Um, but, you know, this whole idea of God made man and man was perfect and man is made in the image of God. And, and that was, you know, that was, that's the story that people bought into. That was the creation myth of its time. Um, you know, why not? That's the best we could come up with. Um, we might laugh at our generation for our ideas in another thousand years' time. Um, so not, not to uh, not to patronize. Um, but eventually, uh, Darwin showed something else. And likewise, when we started to look at the nature of matter, and and you know, people took 
the idea of science and physics and started to dissect bodies and looked at various moving parts and, you know, all sorts of uh, ideas that were once considered to be fact were soon discovered to be myth. And that was the emergence of modern science. So modern science kind of takes the lead for a while. And, and, and modern science takes the axiom, and I'll just to explain to the listeners what I mean when I say an axiom. Uh, an axiom, incidentally, implies something that is so ingrained in our in, in, in the way we see our reality that we, we think it's a fact um, when it's not a fact. It's, it's, a, it's a view of reality. Um, you know, religion was, to people who experienced religion hundreds of years ago, it was considered to be a fact. God is a fact. Religion is a fact. Um, so much so that they burn people at the stake for not believing in these so-called facts. Um, but when you have Copernicus and Galileo and Darwin and people like that coming on saying, look at this, this doesn't stack up. Then we're just telling you that, that what you think is a fact is not. I'm employing a different kind of technology and I'm telling you that it, it's not what you think it is. And of course, there was uh, no doubt a massive philosophical wrestling match. The same thing is happening again. And, and that is now happening between Western science and more contemporary thinkers like ourselves who are looking at this world not as some empirical system of laws as is cited by the, the kind of, uh, in the, the, the material reductionist axiom, but in fact as something far more flexible, far more how would I say, oneric, far more dreamlike in its texture. And in order to accommodate that, we are going to have to revise our ontological position. And that's going to create friction. And it is creating friction. And hence, you see people like uh, Deepak Chopra uh, getting into arguments with uh, Michael, Michael, what's his face? And Michael Shermer and, and, and Daniel Dennett and... Uh, Richard Dawkins and, and all, you know, all those, that, that bullshit that goes back and forth. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I've thought about that. Do I want to get into that debate? Do I want to be one of those guys? And, and for a while it, it seemed like tempting. I mean, could I get up there and wrestle with these idiots? Um, and I thought about Richard Dawkins arguing with the Christians. And, and my conclusion was that, you know, never try to teach a, a pig to dance because the pig won't learn and you'll only frustrate the pig. And frankly, you frustrate yourself while you're trying to frustrate the pig. And the fact of the matter is that if people want to insist on that, um, that, that, that kind of view of reality and they can't see past it, I don't really want to have that conversation with them. If, if they're a little more curious about things and, and they want to discover something else, then I think that probably where we're taking it is where they ought to be looking. And when I say we, I mean, people, who are trying to build a more complete picture of reality that allows, that doesn't just allow, pardon me, that that accepts that the subjective experience must somehow be part of our picture of reality, that we cannot reduce reality down to some fundamental principles and laws, that reality is not something that we can eventually dissect and label and put on a shelf, that there's something subjective at the nature, at, at the heart of reality that we must accommodate and we must build a model to do that. And, and that's going to be something that we're going to have, we're going to labor to do that. But that's what's coming. Reality in, in my opinion, I, I, I hate to say it is inherently subjective. Well, there will be people in the same camp as Dawkins and Dennett and people like that, and, and maybe those two guys are prime examples who are genuine, you know, in their convictions and their beliefs, if I can use the word beliefs there. Uh, but there's also an element of gatekeeping going on without a doubt, and you risk getting bogged down in that, I think, if you engage too much um, in this area, uh, you know, along the lines of what you said, you can get very distracted and beating your head against a wall. And perhaps sometimes you've got to move around underneath, over whatever direction you want to go through these people and, and just, you know, push on. But thinking back to what you were saying earlier about the idea that some people might even be able to lucid dream as a result of being told about lucid dreaming, the idea that this is possible. I love this idea about that we can we can be told what's possible because that plays into some of what we're talking about now of being told what is and for some people their ideas about reality are constrained by something simultaneously as cast iron and as flimsy 
as an idea received from somewhere else, something they have been told, if you see what I mean. It can have an iron grip on their minds for you know their entire lives, and yet and all it can fall away just like paper lace, if you say what I mean, under the right circumstances. So that's a bit of a um, ironic situation in itself, but it holds out, holds open great possibilities for the spread of ideas and how that you know that we should move beyond. And I think this is one of the things that that you and I discussed prior to our first interview about m- moving beyond a certain um, dialectic that's, that's going on, a, you know, a certain circling of the wagons and uh, <laughs> you know chasing tails that's going on and you know and there is forward motion is being created but it could be much quicker i think in some respects if certain people just dropped certain things you know certain uh, you know pick your fights i suppose is the expression i'm looking for yeah pick your fights man for sure don't don't, don't there's, there's no need to waste your time arguing with uh, richard dawkins of the world they, you know he doesn't want to know it's fine it's cool whatever man I had an idea with regard to you were talking about everything and anything and uh, earlier on, and uh, I had this idea once, and it was as a, it was actually while I was exper- experiencing quite intense hypnagogia. I've always called it hypnagogia. Some people say hypnagogia. I don't know which it is to be honest with you. Um, never had a definitive answer on that, but and the idea was a simple one, and it was a two word concept was everything exists, and that stuck with me ever since. And I've not really been able to, to crystallize it any better than that, except to say it's probably an expression of the concept that every thing, every idea, every event, every person, place, every object of which we cannot conceive, every form of matter and non-matter, every idea, everything mental, everything material, everything mind, everything of body, that could ever exist, has ever existed, will ever exist, exists. And if that just sounds like stoner nonsense, well, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry, but that, that was that one idea popped into my head and it just seemed very elegant and simple. And for me, it was like, well, of course. But, it, but you're simply echoing what I'm just saying myself two minutes ago, really, um, when I said that we are, you know, we are, as the uh, Aborigines say, just learning to survive in infinity. Um, and I, I think that's really what's going on here is that we are infinite. Um, we are infinite. I, that, that, that is an inconceivable idea, uh, in its own right. And yet it's quite simple. Um, where I was three years ago in my own kind of, uh, personal development was where I feel most people pretty much end up indefinitely. Um, which is in this deep intellectual inquiry about the nature of reality that if I think about this thing hard enough or if I, you know, put enough models together or if I read this guy's book or that guy's book and I compare notes with this, that and the other thing and I put it all together that one day I'll figure it all out. It'll be terrifically complicated, but I'll have the ultimate equation. I'll figure everything out. But that's not really what Zen teaches, and it certainly wasn't my experience. And incidentally, I never uh, practiced Zen, just to be clear about that. I'm not trying to advocate Zen, and I'm a Zen guy. It's not what I'm saying. I incidentally came to the conclusion, as the Zen guys did, and I suspect from my karate background, that's probably some heritage that I was unaware of there. But it's it, probably just coincidence. But th- with Zen, the answer is simple. And from my experience, the answer is simple. And the answer, plain and simple, is this is it. What this is it. This reality that we're experiencing, that, that this is it. And what this is, is here and it's now. And it's, it's I. It's wherever way you look at this thing, the answer is always here. It's always now. And it's always you answering that question. And therefore, what that is, is any which way you look at it. It can be experienced any which way you can experience it. And those experiences that you haven't had yet, when you look at them, it'll be here, it'll be now, and it'll be you having it. And, you know, had you the same experience two weeks ago or three weeks ago, it would still have been you here now. And it ultimately comes down to something very simple, which is that it's you, and it's here, and it's now, and that's it. And what is it? It's whatever you think it is, that reality is, reality is an idea. It's not this 
this this thing that you keep trying to build into this massively complex feat of consciousness to these, these abstract ideas that you're building on trying to say well it's made of this and it works like this way and it works like that and i'm not dismissing any of that stuff it, yeah it works all those ways it works any which way you look at it <laughs> because in the end it's actually quite simple it's just you doing you so you're right it's it's actually quite simple and and if you ask if you came to a workshop with me now i can assure you if you came to a workshop with me three years ago i probably would have given you uh, some long-winded essay about holonomic theory or something like that and i would have broke down the equations for you and shown you the mathematics and explained why the brain composes information the way it does and so forth you're you honestly not only would have you been bored but you would have been confused and i would have been confused with you but if you came to a workshop now what i would say to you simply is it's simple it's whatever you think it is because reality is an idea as i say on my facebook uh, page reality is a story you're telling yourself well if folks look up reality in the dictionary for example you know try a variety of different dictionaries and see where you get <laughs> you then come back to our ideas about limitations of language because the first thing that occurs is the word itself reality Okay. And you try to think, well, okay, come on, just a couple more words, but what is reality? Okay. It's, it's what we experience. Okay. Okay. So you're telling me it is what we experience. So what is, what's the definition of what? What's the definition of we? What's the definition of experience? Okay. It's what you experience then. Okay. <laughs> well, we've got the what and the experience. What's the definition of you? And it all starts to break down. And I'm not trying to sort of, um, I mean, language is so important because it's how we express ourselves. You know, we think in terms of language, but that in itself is, is, can be very, very revealing because is there a way to go beyond? And this gets us back to symbolism, I guess, and some of the pre, you know, modern language ways of, of doing and, and being and thinking. Is there something above and beyond the words that we're using and the mental constructs that come with those and the limitations? And, and also the, you know, the extensions that they allow, you know, the, the leaps that the language allowed people to make in terms of expressing themselves. But is there something above and beyond that that's more meaningful, more powerful, more representative? Again, I'm, I'm searching for words. Well, you know, to kind of put this in a very Zen frame, reality is what happens before language. Mm -hmm. and, and ultimately, when language steps on stage, reality now becomes a different expression it, it, it starts to reflect on itself and and that's when we fall into this kind of infinite debate between each other between ourselves between our own ideas but ultimately what we're trying to find is our way back to the world before language and before we start to examine it with the construct of language language is a, is, is a wonderful way to experience our world but to confuse um, how we describe the world to what the world is, to quote Alan Watts, would be like looking at the menu and confusing it for the dinner and getting hungry. Uh, you know, you, you can't eat the menu. The menu describes the dinner. It's not the dinner. And language describes reality. It's not what reality is. And what he's alluding to is this notion that ultimately uh, what we see the world as is a conceptual evaluation of the circumstance and not the circumstance itself and when we try to resolve the world when we try to understand the world in a conceptual way the problem with concept is that concept is infinite and when we match concept with concept with concept we create a kind of an interference pattern of concepts which creates new patterns which are new concepts and we think that if we keep going that direction and we spend long enough at it is in theoretical physics, is in philosophy, um, that eventually we come to the ultimate conclusion, when in fact what we do is drive ourselves fucking nuts. <laughs> what you need to do is to deconstruct the concepts and turn the opposite direction. There's a saying that to be a wise man means to learn something new every day. To be enlightened means to let something go every day. So enlightenment is, is, is movement towards... It, it's 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 a deconstruction of reality rather than when i say a deconstruction i don't mean I mean, a physicist will argue that physics is a deconstruction of reality but it's not physics in its attempt to deconstruct reality is simply reconstructing more concepts 
And it's quite paradoxical to deconstruct something by simply letting it go. And to some extent, it really is not a question of, of actively trying to do anything as much as it is of just recognizing that what it is is what it is. And there's nothing to ask. And that doesn't mean to say people should stop inquiring. It doesn't mean to say we should stop developing technology. It doesn't mean to say that we should be compl- complacent about the current situation with uh, our politics, our refugees, our economic crises. All those things should be tended to in their own way, in their own manner. We should still be developing technology. We should still be developing ways of understanding the nature of reality. But for somebody who really is seeking liberation from this sense of of anxiety that that seems to be inherent to the uh, to the human being, as we've kind of talked about previously. I think we spoke about it in the last podcast. We certainly spoke about it off air. Um, you know, wh- why why are we anxious? And 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 actually, I think we got into this in the last podcast. And I said the reason we're anxious, plain and simple, is because we're self conscious. To be self conscious means that we have created a concept of self. We've identified with it, and we said, "I'm that." So we've we've attached to the concept. We've said that, that that concept, I'm that. But this is the same mistake, as I said, is to confuse the menu with the dinner and to try to resolve it that way. We think that the self is a real something. And that self is, in fact, a concept. And when we confuse that conceptual self for the actual nature of our true, infinite selves, and then try to resolve that conceptual self with all the other concepts within the, the world around us, we get into an endless debate. And really what we're trying to do, as, as I'm trying to express in the book, is to try to deconstruct that concept of self, to let it go. And the way you do that is not by building a more elaborate essay of concepts that you think will somehow break down this concept. You won't. You'll tie yourself up even more. In the end, it's, it's a lot about just letting go. Yeah, the map is not the territory. And the finger pointing at the moon is not the moon, as I think I said last time. (laughs) Okay, Rory, we're going to leave it there for today. Uh, We're going to come back and do at least one more part on this uh, in the very near future. Uh, But before we sign off, just tell folks about the book and your website. Once again, the the book is The Paradox of Lucid Dreaming, A Metaphysical Theory of Mind. And at your website, there's all sorts of resources, information about the book. And of course, you've got your own podcast series. Yeah, great. So um, as uh, Greg says, certainly wakeupinyourdreams.com, you'll pretty much find whatever you need to do uh, regarding lucid dreaming there. And um, my own podcast, Reality Check Podcast, I'm really just throwing lots of ideas out there, uh, playing it by ear mostly. Um, and, and Facebook, I'm, I'm a big Facebook fan. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a Facebooker and I'm proud and, and that's how it is. It's, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm out of the closet. I'm out of my Facebook closet. Um, so certainly that's the best place to catch me really so feel free to just come in there comment share do whatever you need to do it's a modern world it's where we're all meeting up so listen um, thanks to the listeners and moreover uh, thanks to you Greg for having me on no not at all Rory all my pleasure and uh, I look forward to doing part 3 with you in the new year thank you again really seriously thank you very much well folks that's it for another week as ever thank you so much for listening if you enjoyed the show check out the website which is legalizefreedom.com that's legalize-freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programs offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including politics and economics, energy and environment, culture, spirituality, history, and the nature of reality. You can also browse and buy a range of publications from our guests, and if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Whether you listen, donate, or do both, I greatly appreciate your support. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.